Hello everyone, and welcome back to day two of our spiritual journey, where we take a look at 31 stories of different women of the Bible. Now, today we will be focusing on Hagar, servant of Abraham and Sarah. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Hagar sank to her knees beside the spring. Her tears had long since dried on her face, but her hands still shook so much as she, as she scooped water into them that she spilled as much as she drank. It was a long time before she was able to drink enough to stop her thirst. Hagar huddled in the shade of, of a wind-blown tree and wrapped her arms around her belly. The baby inside of her kicked hard enough to make her gasp. She wondered if he could tell they were in a strange place, far from the familiar sounds of her master Abram's camp and the movements of Hagar's daily routine. Could the baby hear her groans and feel her chest heaving with sobs? Was he frightened too? Hagar rubbed the spot where her baby was kicking and tried to calm her breathing. Hagar regretted allowing herself to believe that Abram would favor her over his wife of so many years, simply because Hagar was carrying his only child, the son he believed was part of a promise from his God. She regretted even more giving into the temptation to treat her mistress, Sarai, like a secondary wife. Sarai's revenge had been quick and harsh. Hagar's body ached with bruises, and Sarai's angry words felt like they had been burned across her heart and mind. Sarai had made Hagar's life so miserable that she felt she'd had no choice but to run away. Now she was alone in the desert, pregnant and on the run. She would be an easy target for anyone who came along, if she didn't die of hunger or thirst or fall prey to a wild animal first. Hagar. She looked around wildly. Had someone from Abram's camp noticed her escape and followed her? But she didn't recognize the person who had spoken. His voice was gentle. It had been so long since anyone had said her name with kindness, but he seemed to carry a power and authority that made it hard to look at him. Servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Hagar gulped. If he knew she was Sarai's servant, there was no point in lying. She was too tired and frightened to make up a convincing story anyway. She took a deep breath. I am running away from Sarai. She wanted to explain, to tell him about the beatings and insults, the bruises and tears, but she knew he wouldn't care. No one cared about a servant's feelings. Sarai ruled over Hagar's life as absolutely as the Pharaoh reigned over Egypt, her home country. When Sarai had ordered Hagar to become Abram's servant wife and have a child with him, Hagar had no choice. When her baby was born, Hagar was supposed to simply hand him over and Sarai would raise him as her own. And when Sarai wanted to treat Hagar harshly, Hagar was supposed to endure it without a single complaint. This stranger would think she was a criminal for running away. The stranger was quiet for a long time, so long that Hagar couldn't stand it anymore. She risked peeking at his face. He was looking at her, but not with judgment or harshness. His gaze was soft and kind, like he knew what she'd been through, all her sadness and anger, all the wrong and unfair things that had been done to her. Go back to Sarai and be a faithful servant to her, the stranger said. Hagar's heart sank. She must have only imagined the kindness in his eyes. But then the stranger said, I will give you more descendants than you can count. What? How many times has she overheard Abram talking about the same kind of promise from his God? Who was this person? Soon you will have a son, the stranger said. You should name him Ishmael, because God has heard your cries of sadness. Ishmael, God hears. Could it be true? Had God heard her? Hagar thought about all the times she'd hid her tears from Sarai and Abram and the other servants, all the times she'd cried as silently as she could while everyone slept. She had run away because no one was on her side or cared what happened to her. But God had sent a God had sent a messenger just to tell her he'd heard her and to promise that her son would be a great man. 
and that she would be the mother of a nation. Hagar sat for a long time after God's messenger disappeared, lost in wonder. Finally, she bowed her head. You are the God who sees me, she prayed. Then she got up and turned toward Abram's camp. She didn't know what kind of welcome would be waiting for her there, but she knew that whatever happened, she would be heard and cared for and known by the God who saw her. Her world. As a servant in Bible times, Hagar's status was very low. Her masters had complete authority over her, and she was dependent on them for everything she needed to live. Hagar was from Egypt, so when she joined Abram's household, she left behind her homeland and culture, and possibly most, if not all, of her family and friends as well. Sarai's plan to make Hagar have a baby for her was not an uncommon thing in those times. The idea was that the servant was supposed to have a child for the wife who was unable to get pregnant. The baby would be considered the wife's child and would be the master's heir. People believed then masters even owned their servants' bodies and could tell them what to do in every aspect of their lives. When Hagar became pregnant, she began to act like she was more important than Sarai. It's possible Hagar believed that Abram would be so happy she was giving him the child he'd wanted for so long that he would make Hagar his chief wife, giving her a higher status than Sarai. But whatever the reason, Sarai was furious at Hagar's behavior, and Abram told her to do whatever she wanted to her servant. The Bible tells us that Sarai treated Hagar harshly. We don't know exactly what that means, but it was bad enough that Hagar was willing to risk running away. People usually traveled in groups in those days, and it would have been especially dangerous for a woman to be alone. Hagar was so miserable, she was willing to risk her and her baby's life to get away from Sarai, her God. The Bible tells us that God is not impressed when we act like some people are more important than others. We see that clearly in Hagar's story, where God gives a frightened, abused servant girl the same promise he gave to her wealthy, important boss. <clears throat> Since Abram gave Hagar's son the name God chose for him, Ishmael, which means God hears, we can assume Hagar told Abram about what happened to her. Ishmael's name would have been a lesson and a constant reminder to Abram and Sarai that God cared about Hagar. Do you feel that no one sees or hears you? Sometimes the world can be full of messages telling us we're less important or significant or loved than other people. Maybe you're the youngest in your family and it feels like your siblings or parents are too busy to really listen to you. Maybe it feels like everyone at school is more popular or better looking or has nicer things or is smarter or more athletic or more talented. Maybe you have a different skin color or ethnicity or culture than most of the people around you and it feels like no one truly understands or values you. However small and unimportant and unnoticed you may feel, you can know for sure that God sees you. He sees every tear you cry in the dark. He knows all the things you secretly wish for. He loves you deeply and wants to be close to you. The God who saw a frightened servant girl in the middle of the desert is the same God who sees you today. And now, just as we did last time, we're going to pause and reflect on what we have read. Again, you can either talk about it with God, you can say it out loud to yourself, you can talk about it with your mom or your dad or your Bible study or anybody that you trust or want to talk to. You can even draw pictures. And if you need ideas, well, here are some things to consider, like what was just read. Have you ever felt like Hagar? Have you ever felt like you were unimportant simply because of how you looked or where you were from or what you could or couldn't do? How do you hear God talking to you? Because in this case, Hagar was visited by one of his, by one of God's servants directly, one of his angels. But God talks to us in even smaller ways. How do you hear him talking to you? And since we can likely assume that whoever appeared to Hagar was an angel, Maybe you could write a letter to your guardian angel, thanking your guardian angel for always taking care of you and looking out for you. Write about what you think your angel looks like. 
write about what you think your angel has done for you. Remember, you know, write about times that you felt alone. And remember the times that God or your guardian angel or anybody really made you feel less alone. Write about anything that's in your mind and on your heart. Okay, now that we've had a moment to reflect, feel free to share what you wrote either down in the comments or to yourself or to God or to anybody else that you wanna share it with. So, what do I think of what I just read? Well, I can certainly remember several occasions where I have felt like Hagar. I may have mentioned several times on this channel that I'm autistic. And for those of you who aren't autistic, you may be wondering what that's like. Well, imagine being told constantly that you're too blunt or too rude or inappropriate or creepy or awkward. And imagine asking yourself, what have I done wrong? Imagine so many people criticizing you and telling you that you're wrong for just being yourself. That's what being autistic growing up was like for me on many occasions. It made me feel like I didn't fit in with the rest of my peers. It's caused me to have a lot of trouble with making friends, even when I try to be as friendly as possible. And it kind of got to a point where I decided it would be best for me to just not even try because I knew I wasn't interested in anything else that the other girls were interested in. How could I possibly connect with them? How could we possibly have any kind of a relationship when we're just too different? Especially when I'm too awkward and annoying, considering so many other people had shunned me. I got to a point where I thought, you know what, if that's how it's gonna be, what's the point? Thankfully, I've had a lot of help since then. And I've realized that there are people out there like me who may have been through the same thing, like Hagar. And God has given me those people to say, hey, I know it's tough and I know you feel like you're alone, but you're not and I'm watching over you. I hear what you're going through. Just keep on keeping on and someday you'll show all those people who were mean to you, all those people who thought you were awkward and annoying, someday you'll show them something really great. And that's part of why that book is so important to me because all of these women show that there's no one way of being a woman and that however you choose to express your femininity, it's equally valid. No one is too important, no one is more important, no one is more pretty, no one is more valuable. We're all equal in the eyes of the Lord. So, now that I have shared that, why don't we grow close with a prayer? Let's start with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. We thank you so much for our time here at this moment on earth. We thank you for all the many gifts that you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you'll help us to remember in the moments where we feel our lowest, when we feel the most alone, when we feel like nobody understands us, that you are always looking out for us and that you hear every cry in the dark we make and that you know everything that's on our minds and in our hearts. And we thank you for all of your love and unending support. Help us to love others in return. Help us to humble ourselves to realize that no one is more important than anybody else. Help us to remember to use our gifts and our strengths to build others up and not just ourselves. So, in your name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for joining me again today, and we will see you tomorrow.